So since Spider-Man 2 is coming out in, um, I don't even know when I'm actually going to be releasing this video, so it, it's coming out. <laughs> but what I wanted to do in preparation before this game was, I wanted to take it back. Take it back to the beginning, or at least the, uh, like the, the earliest sister we have of Insomniac Spider-Man. Doesn't really matter. Today, I'm going to be going over and going through the Spider-Man PS4 prequel novel, which is canon. And there is some pretty pretty interesting stuff in here and actually i actually thought this was a damn good story and it only deepened my appreciation for spider-man ps4 even more there's some characters mentioned here and some characters that are in this story that you're probably going to be surprised about that kind of expand the insomniac universe and i'm not going to be you know i'm not going to just basically be reading this whole book to you i'm just kind of like throughout this video i'm just going to kind of be summarizing like the events that happened in this book in a good amount of detail or at least the amount of detail that you kind of need to know so with all that that being said, uh, let's get into it. So the book starts off and there's a quote and it actually says, For Claudia, my long-suffering wife, she had no idea what she was getting into. What do you mean by that? <laughs> but anyway, so the story starts off with Peter chasing someone who was robbing a snake store. Peter chases the guy up to one of the highest floors in the building where he realizes it was just it was just a kid. The kid throws one of the snakes at Peter, but Peter notices that it was a big snake and they aren't usually venomous. He thinks to himself it would have been easy to dodge, but it was a living creature and even slithery things deserve soft landings. You know, this is why Spider-Man's a goat. While Peter was dealing with the snake, the kid jumped out of a window. Peter sprinted to the window, but it was too late. But luckily, the snake thief landed on an awning two stories down, bouncing onto another lower awning, then sticking the landing on the street. After a bit more chasing, Peter catches the snake thief, webs him up, then calls the cops. He knew the guy would never be charged with anything, as he could claim that Spider-Man abducted him and planted any air the evidence. But Peter did the right thing anyway, or at least what he thought was the right thing. Because because when Peter opened up the bag, he found that there was no snakes alive in the bag. In fact, they were never alive because the guy he was chasing had a bag of rubber snakes. <laughs> and this conversation is pretty funny too. Peter says, why did you steal a bag of rubber snakes? The thief says, who are you? Peter says, really? What am I paying my PR team for? To which the guy replies, you're one of them superheroes, ain't you? And Peter says, so the who are you is more of a philosophical question. The thief says, sorry, I just get nervous sometimes, you know. Perfectly normal given that you've just been caught doing a stupid felony. Now let's start asking, why would you break into a snake store stealing rubber snakes. The thief says, I didn't. Peter goes, <sighs> okay, let's start over. I'm Spider-Man. I thought you were Daredevil. Do I look like Daredevil? Eh, kind of, but kind of not. Less horns, more, uh, webs. Peter balls up his fist and asks, how about you tell me your name? Andy. Okay, Andy, walk me through this. I caught you robbing a snake store. You ran away clutching a bag of rubber snakes. Walk me through this. I didn't get the chance to steal anything. You showed up and messed with the plant, so I didn't do anything wrong. The rubber snakes in there are mine. I paid for them. Peter thinks to himself, there's nothing to be gained from asking. But he asks anyway. And you brought them with you. Why exactly? To which Andy replies, so the snakes in the bag wouldn't get lonely. <laughs> I had a list. I needed a particular snake. No ordinary snake would do. But you showed up, and then things went bad, so I didn't steal anything. So I'm not in any kind of trouble, right? What, for breaking into a store and destroying private property? Surely there's no law against that. Come on, S-Man. No harm, no foul. Actually, there's plenty of harm and foul. Not least of which is calling me S-Man. You broke the law, and I'm going to call the police. You'll stay webbed up until they arrive. But I didn't do nothing. I think we've covered this already. Maybe you want to review your notes. I knew I shouldn't have done it. It was my brother's idea. He said it would be easy money, but I guess I should have known. He just didn't want me around and he was off doing stuff for Scorpion. Wait a minute, Scorpion? Like, the scorpion? Big guy? Anger problems? A tail? Yup, that's him. Do you know him? Are you guys, like, friends? No, we're not friends because, and this may have escaped your notice, I'm a good guy and he's a bad guy. These sorts of dynamics don't usually promote lasting friendships. But you don't seem so much evil as, let's say, misguided. So how about you tell me everything you know about the Scorpion, and if it seems useful, I can let you go. I don't know anything except that he's using a construction site as a hideout or something. He's like stashing his equipment and plans and stuff there. That actually seems like a decent amount of knowledge. My brother likes to brag when he's drinking. And if he's breathing, he's drinking. It seemed like too much to hope for, but the kid knew exactly where the building was. His brother had shown it to him when, big surprise, he'd been drinking. <laughs> Figuring he'd gotten everything he was going to get out of Andy, Peter sprayed a dissolving agent on the webs. Okay, now get out of here. Can I go back to the store and get my snakes? Andy? Spider-Man said in a warning tone like a parent talking to a toddler. <laughs> right, Andy nodded. No more stealing. Spider-Man let out another sigh. <sighs> Andy, what do you do all day other than listen to your drunk brother? I don't know, come up with plans, I guess. Listen, you seem like a nice enough kid. I've got an idea that's a lot better than sticking you in a cell. 
There's a place in Little Tokyo. It's called Feast, and it's where the homeless go for help. They could really use some volunteers, and you'd pick up some marketable skills working there. It's a win-win kind of thing. What do you say? Andy's face lit up again. That would be great. I like being helpful. Okay, then you should skedaddle before the cops show up. Then Peter heads off to stop Scorpion. When Peter arrives, he surveys the area, and Andy's information is lining up. After checking out the place and figuring out that it was some sort of staging area, he calls MJ. And something that I didn't mention was that Peter had called MJ about three times to check up on her because, and I quote, MJ was off doing something that she didn't want to tell him about, which is why Peter was out on patrol clearing his head. Before heading in, he tried to call MJ. He'd made an attempt before leaving the dock, but it had gone straight to voicemail, and this time it was the same result. Peter says, me again, just wanted to hear your voice before I valiantly throwing myself into danger, but I know you're busy, so it's cool. He hoped his tone conveyed that he wasn't really serious, but also that he was, he was a little serious. After looking around the construction site, Peter heads up to the roof as he hears a loud noise and his spider sense was buzzing. While going up to the roof, he gets a call back from MJ. MJ. Peter takes out the thugs while talking to MJ on the phone. I'll put the text for their conversation on the screen if you want to read it. But after beating all the thugs, Peter's spider sense is going off and, to quote, his spider sense went off like a tingly explosion. It wasn't an exactly an 11 out of 10 scale, but it was easily an 8. These guys weren't the threat, they were bait, and Spider-Man had just blundered into a trap. I think it's pretty cool how they describe the spider sense here, but anyways. The person wasn't Scorpion, he was Spider-Man's own height, slim and wiry like him, dressed in all black. Nothing fancy, sweatpants, and a loose shirt. Over their head was a black shiesty mask, so nothing of his face was visible. Peter led with a few web shooter bursts in an attempt to stop the fight before it even began, but his webs hit nothing but the wall. The person in black had vanished into the dark. Spider-Man thought that the moves looked familiar, like he'd know who this was, if he could just remember where he'd seen a fighting style like that before and then it came to him. Peter realized that he couldn't treat this person like the usual street thug. Peter lobbed out a barrage from his web shooters where the guy was, where he was likely to be next in a fraction of a second, and where he might leap unexpectedly. None of the webs hit the mystery person. Peter tried again, but he still couldn't land a hit. He leapt in, letting his instincts take over. He was ready to dodge, shift, roll, and lunge, whatever it took to get this guy at a disadvantage. The fun had gone on long enough. It was time for his opponent to be webbed up and explain what was going on here. Spider-Man landed behind the man in black. At least that was the plan, but his opponent was already gone. Peter thinks to himself, no wonder the guys I fight get so angry. That's just annoying. Then he was struck from behind. It was like getting slammed by a speeding truck. His foe hit hard and fast, sending Spider-Man skidding across the paved surface. The guy was on top of him. He moved like Spider-Man, but fought like a brawler. There were hands everywhere, slamming into his face, his chest grappling without letting up. <laughs> Jesus, I feel like I'm reading a Fifty Shades of Grey book. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, Peter tries to headbutt the person, but the attacker avoids the blow. The move allowed Spider-Man to break free and leap to the scaffolding. He turned and aimed his wrist, but there was no one to hit. He tensed, ready for a surprise attack from any angle, but then he realized his spider sense was no longer thooming. He moved around the perimeter of the roof fast and erratically, changing his trajectory and his speed to make an ambush more difficult. But it became apparent that this was nothing more than an exercise in caution. The man in black was gone. Peter felt a throbbing on his cheek. The man had done a lot more than held his own. Peter wondered why the man left if he had a chance at actually beating him up, but the bits and pieces suggested a new and dangerous enemy with a completely unknown plan. He needed intel, and at the moment, the guy who set him up and made him look like a chump seemed like a pretty good source. So Peter went back to where he left Andy after realizing he had been set up, but Andy was dead, with cop cars all around the area. There had to be someone behind this, some sort of mastermind. The kid had just been a pawn, even more alarming. Whoever was working with this fake spider person had been confident that it was real. Spider-Man would respond to the break-in at the snake store, that meant someone had been tracking his movements, following where he'd been that night, or what kinds of police calls were likely to grab his attention, or both. That suggested an alarming investment of time and energy. Peter didn't like to let his emotions cloud his thinking, but the fact that Andy was lying dead down there made that hard to do. He'd had the right to live and make mistakes and hopefully learn from them, and someone has taken that away. They'd done that in order to mess with Spider-Man, and that made this personal. Peter also needed to pass this information along to the cops. He saw a guy that appeared to be the one in charge, so Peter would need to get him alone. But while looking down at the scene, Peter heard a voice behind him. Hold it right there. Is this really necessary? It's necessary because you're suspect number one in murder. They talked for a bit and I'll leave the conversation up on screen if you wish to read it, but the officer had been Yuri Watanabe. Yuri ended the conversation by telling Peter to meet her somewhere because she wanted to show him something. Peter arrives at the spot. It was gloomy, but about 12 video monitors illuminated her face, each showing a different section of the facility. Yuri turned the moment he entered and her hand moved towards her gun, but not quite touching it. She might be willing to work with him. She might even be able to trust him on that principle, but she wasn't 
wasn't about to let her guard down. Peter didn't like her any less for it, it was common sense. The video showed Andy walking away from the dock trying to keep to the shadows, probably mindful of the security cameras. Then Spider-Man leapt in behind him, landing lightly on his feet, so lightly that Andy seemed to not notice. Definitely not how things happened. He knew that move. Knew how to land from 30 or 40 feet up without making noise. He did it all the time to get the drop on bad guys. It had taken him months to learn a trick back when he first got his powers, but now it was second nature. <laughs> so I guess this is canon? Anyways, Peter knows that wasn't him. Was it? The moves were right, so much so he had to remind himself that it was impossible. He looked at the time signature on the video, but by that point, he was well on his way to the construction site. He was about to open his mouth to say something when the Spider-Man imposter raised his right hand, he held the gun, the mystery man had shot Andy four times. Spider-Man needed to gather his thoughts. There were a hundred things he wanted to say, and he didn't even know yet what half of them might be. It was hard to stick to logic, though. Andy had died facing an impersonator. He died believing that Spider-Man had gunned him down. It didn't make the crime any worse, but it made him all the more determined to do something about it. I didn't do that. I would never do anything like that, Peter said. It's definitely inconsistent with your past behavior, and it would be hard to prove that one person wearing a mask is the same as another person wearing the same mask. The perp moves a whole lot like you do, though, and it's harder to mimic. If you have an alibi, it would help us. Maybe there's another place you might have been on camera at the same time, though again, we still have the mask and identity problem. First of all, that's not me. I don't use guns, and I absolutely don't go around assassinating people. Even the Daily Bugle back when Jameson was calling for my head never claimed that I would do that. I believe you, Yuri says as she replays the footage, but my opinion doesn't count as evidence. Spider-Man leaned in closer to the screen, peering at the costume figure who appeared there. The suit isn't quite right. It's close, it's a decent copy, definitely better than something you'd get from a costume shop, but the design is a little off. I can't say anything about the color, but the spider icon doesn't exactly look like mine, and the web lines are too close together. I noticed that too, Yuri said. Here, look at the earlier footage. You would have had to change your outfit into something nearly identical, then come right back. It doesn't make sense, but whenever we're dealing with costume vigilantes, making sense doesn't always apply. While trying to play devil's advocate in the situation and wrapping her head around it, Peter tells her what construction site he went to. She let out a long breath that hissed between her clenched teeth. It's hidden behind a hundreds of pages and documents and half a dozen shell companies, but that construction site is owned by Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of crime. Fisk, he thought, the anger blossomed inside of him, radiating outward until it was hard to remain still. Fisk was in the news a lot, but back when he first started Spider-Manning, Peter had been convinced Fisk was, as the tabloids claim, the kingpin of crime, the most ruthless criminal in the city. Sure, Peter was just a high school kid back then, but he'd been driven to prove that he could use his powers responsibly. He'd made a massive mistake. Soon after he got his spider powers, a frivolous decision not to act when he might have acted, should have acted, and that decision not to act led to the death of his uncle Ben. He'd sworn he'd never sit idly when there was something that he could do. Something that would make a difference. And that something had been putting Kingpin behind bars. Spider-Man dedicated months of his life toward that one goal. Disrupting Fisk operations, keeping him off his game, and looking for hard evidence upon which even a bribed or blackmailed district attorney would have to act. Spider-Man dug up that proof. He collected files, laptops, photographs, and witnesses. He'd found enough hard evidence to put Fisk in a bespoke orange jumpsuit for the rest of his life. Back then, it felt like a triumph of a lifetime. He remembered sitting on the couch with Aunt May, shoving fists full of popcorn into his mouth, while the local news showed Fisk walking into the precinct. Then life beat it. Life beat it right down and smacked it up its metaphorical head. Fisk lawyers went to work and suddenly half the news outlets in the city were on Fisk's side. It was a setup, they said. Spider-Man was a thug, a criminal himself, and he wanted an honest businessman like Wilson Fisk destroyed so criminals could reign free. Evidence went missing, documents vanished or changed, photos were altered, computer records disappeared, witnesses forgot things or remembered entirely new accounts that exonerated Wilson Fisk that made him look innocent, made him look like a hero, struggling to save his business while a lawless vandal in a costume tried to tear down everything an honest man had accomplished. So Fisk walked. He'd gone right out of the courthouse and then maybe out of the country. He'd been gone for years too, and maybe that was good enough. Or at least that's what Spider-Man told himself. Sure, it wasn't perfect. No one wanted a guy like Fisk being evil on someone else's turf. But at least Spider-Man had cleaned up his own backyard. If people everywhere did the same, the bad guys would have nowhere to hide. It was weak, Spider-Man knew, but it was all he had. Then, a year ago, Fisk appeared back on the scene, throwing money around, investing into prominent real estate deals, developing long-neglected parts of the city, creating jobs 
jobs and goodwill. The newspapers were full of stories about the Fisk Foundation, a new charitable effort which was aimed at promoting opportunities for New Yorkers of all incomes. Fisk was a changed man, he told anyone who would listen, which included a number of journalists whose organizations were flush with Fisk money. Fisk had never been what the vigilantes had claimed, he told them, but he had been selfish and greedy, focused on nothing but his own bottom line. Hardship had taught him the price of selfishness. Now he understood that he had to do good to do well, and that was why every project he invested in would make the city a little bit better and improve the lives of citizens. He didn't want to profit unless others profited too. That was what he claimed, and that was what plenty of people seemed to believe. But the truth was, Fisk was back in drugs and extortion and hijacking and money laundering, all of his old tricks. If it was dirty and violent and profitable, he had his hands on it. Spider-Man knew it, and he was sure he could prove it, but he didn't know if proving it would change a thing. It didn't last time. I know you've got your own history with that piece of garbage, Yuri said. That's one of the reasons I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. I've been trying to build a case against Fisk since he came back on the scene, but I've had to only do it on the sly. There are plenty of people above me who don't want Fisk investigated. Fisk always had cops on his payroll, allegedly, but those charges were dropped. Remember, you played a pretty big part in his arrest that time. What was that, five years ago? Seven, Spider-Man said. Right, Yuri replies. I guess the question is, what is Fisk after now? Why go to all this trouble? What does setting you up get him? Seems like it's better to focus on catching this imposter, Spider-Man proposed. Fisk is slippery and we can worry about his motives later. This bogus Spider-Man, bogus me, might provide all the answers. Can you ask for the video feed from the construction site, Peter asked? We can ask, Yuri replied, but if they say no, we'll need a search warrant. And without any evidence of a crime, but your word, I don't see that happening. Even if we could get a warrant, it'll take time. Fisk might have people erase or alter the feed by then. Why would Fisk even have a secret construction site, Spider-Man? Spider-Man asked. Everyone knows he's a real estate developer. This building is nothing but high-end luxury co-ops. There's nothing noble about it, nothing that benefits the common man. It's meant to make a ton of money so he doesn't want it getting out, since it's not consistent with his new good guy con. None of this tells us what he wants. It looks like good old-fashioned revenge to me. You mess with him, now he's messing with you. You really hurt him back in the day. You gathered a ton of good evidence, but Fisk's lawyers were able to kick up plenty of reasonable doubt, especially with evidence gathered by a guy who dresses like a spider. So there's no point in going after him again? I didn't say that. If you'd had someone on the inside helping you out, someone who could clean the evidence the way Fisk launders money, things might have turned out differently the first time. I know you costume types are loners, but maybe we could help each other out. This was what Peter had been waiting to hear. It was a terrific idea, but he didn't want to appear too anxious. So he leaned back and folded his arms. Maybe. I'm going to go on the offense argue that we suppress the Spider-Man angle. Say the evidence makes it clear, and it does, that this is an imposter looking to stir the pot, and we don't want to play his game. Sooner or later, the guy will have to strike again, and someone else gets killed? Maybe, maybe not. There's no reason to think he'll play the same hand twice. There's also no reason that he, to think that he won't use violence again. No matter what we do, our best option is to keep him playing our game rather than us play his. Meanwhile, you and me go after Fisk. Go after him now? I don't know, she admitted. I need to give this some thought, but you can go places that I can't, and I know things that you you don't. Your ability should be able to get to land us evidence I'd never get my hands on otherwise, and I can turn it into something that will hold up in court. Let me chew on this a little while, and if you don't like what I come up with, you can tell me to get lost. But I have a feeling that you'd like to see Fisk go down as much as I would. Yuri held out her hand, they shook, and maybe it was just the emotion of the moment, but it felt as if something monumentous had just happened. Let's hope we don't make things worse, Peter said. Yuri grinned. I can see you're going to be a whole lot of fun to work with. As the story moves along, we get a look into Peter's headspace about Fisk and his struggles balancing his life as a superhero. He was worried that he hadn't heard from MJ in a while, so he went to Harry. As Peter believed if there was anyone else she would go to talk to, it would be Harry, and Peter would rather it be Harry than anyone else. Harry and Peter talked for a bit, and I'll put the conversation up on the screen. But after Harry tells Peter where MJ has gone, he finds out that MJ was working on a story that was related to Fisk. After meeting up with MJ, he asks, how can you agree to do a puff piece on that guy? I know what Fisk is, MJ whispered, but this is a good story. It could get me a job at the Bugle, and then I'll stick with it, because if I cover Fisk, even if it's from a features perspective, I might dig up the proof that pokes holes in his PR balloon. Peter thought back to what he'd learned from Lieutenant Watanabe, that Fisk was still developing high-end real estate, only hiding it behind shell corporations. A story like that could expose his hypocrisy for the new Fisk, but it might also risk Yuri's sources. Or worse, it could put MJ in Fisk's crosshairs, and there was no way he was going to do that. Peter took MJ by the arm and he gently led her outside. What he had to say to her next might elicit a loud reaction, and he didn't want that to happen right in front of the smiling Mr. Ocampo. You don't want to cross Fisk, Peter said. You don't even want him to wonder if you might be thinking of crossing him. Best of all, you don't want him to know that you exist. A guy like that won't hesitate to have a journalist killed. MJ glared at him for a moment, 
before responding. What, you can take all the risks, but I can't? Is that the way this works now? Because it's the first I've heard of it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you could focus on other types of stories for the moment. Like dog shows? The latest app craze? Come on, MJ. No, you come on, she said, poking him in the chest. She was so intense that he felt a buzzing in the back of his head. I'm applying for the features job because that's where there's an opening. But my goal, my real goal, is investigative reporting. Once they see what I can do, I'll have a shot at it. This is my calling, Peter. It's what I want to do. It's how I can make a difference. You of all people should understand that. And you can't seriously tell me to not follow my dream. <sighs> No, I can't, and I wouldn't. That seemed to do it. She took a step back and smiled at Peter. Look, I know you worry, and I worry about you too, but I've learned to deal with it, and now you're gonna have to learn to live with what I do too. Suddenly, Peter realized that the buzzing hadn't stopped. There was a scrape of shoe against the pavement. What a sweet couple of lovebirds. They turned, and there was a man standing there. He looked like every other passerby, cotton shirt, jeans, and a jacket, and a switchblade. Hand over your wallets, he said, jewelry too. You don't want to do this, MJ said. Just walk around and turn your life around. Don't tell me what- That's as far as he got in his sentence, because MJ's knee had already made contact with his balls. And though it was hardly necessary, as the man fell to the sidewalk, she added a kick. Then she leaned over him as he squirmed on the ground. Remember, crime doesn't pay, she told him as she scooped up up his knife and closed it. Then she looked over at Peter, and MJ says, good thing you were here to save me. Peter gave her a wry grin and said, okay, point taken. We're next introduced to Maya Lopez, aka Echo, if you know who she is. But it's revealed that just like the comics, Fisk takes her in after killing her father, but Echo does not know this. The reason that Fisk took her in is because he saw potential in her. But while spying on Fisk, she sees Fisk with the same person who murdered her father. She barged in without knocking, still sweaty from her sparring. Maya looked out of place in this large, cheerless office. Maya was too soft-hearted. She wasn't ruthless in the way he needed her to be. There was still time to mold her, though. He felt certain she would become what he needed. Fisk reached to turn off the video feed, but it was too late. She had already seen it. The expression on her face told him all that he needed to know. What is that? Maya asked. I've asked you to knock, Fisk said. She was kind-hearted, but not soft. She deflected his deflection without missing a beat. Moving around to the the side of his desk as if it was her space as much as his. She gestured toward the video screen. Is that what Mr. Hoang came in to tell you about? It's not important, Fisk said as he switched off the monitor and turned to see if she would defy him. It's important to me, Maya insisted. She pointed an accusing finger at the now blank video screen. That thing killed my father. And we will bring Spider-Man to justice, Fisk said. I've promised you that, but we must wait for the right time. With everything we have in play, an all-out battle with a costume vigilante isn't in our best interest. Once we've achieved our goals, when we have power in the influence to do as we please, then we will crush him. I've given you my word, and I intend to keep it. Who was he fighting, Maya demanded. The man in black. He moved just like him. Even recalling her uncanny powers of observation, he was surprised that she had seen so much, and so quickly. She could recall anything she'd even glimpsed, recreate any image in the smallest detail, but this was something new. Perhaps her fleeting image was like a photograph that could be studied from every angle. Was her mind truly so acute? Fisk sighed inwardly. This wasn't something that should involve her. He wanted her to remain passionate in her hatred of Spider-Man, but sometimes that passion is a single-minded focus, and that became more of a burden than an advantage. Yet, boxing her out at this point would do more harm than good. Close the door and have a seat, he told her. I'll tell you everything, Fisk says. Fisk basically tells Maya everything about the mystery man who moved like Spider-Man, telling her the man in black's name was Michael Bingham. Maya thinks that Peter is the one responsible for killing her father, and she wants to kill him. After studying Spider-Man's fighting style for years, and then next we move on to Peter at his job at Octavius Industries. They never outright mention Otto, most likely due to the fact that this book came out before the game, and they didn't really want to spoil that Otto was in the game before it came out. But it's very obvious that who they're talking about if you've played the game. There's also two other people that work with Peter at the time, and while one of them is kind of important to this story, she's not really necessary to like kind of go over. Then we move on to some stuff with MJ at the Bugle, and we're introduced to Betty Brand and it's in this moment where MJ actually gets a job at the Bugle. But anyways, nothing here too important happens otherwise, so I'll just move on. Maya was scouting over Michael Bingham's house. After some time, she saw him jump out of his window in a Spider-Man suit. She followed him, but he moved so fast that it was tough to keep up. The man bullied a homeless guy and then went home. Maya was trying to figure out what the man's game was. Bullying some homeless guy wasn't exactly going to bring Spider-Man to his knees. A handful of people might decide that he wasn't the hero they thought he was. That story might make the newspapers, though that was less likely now that J. Jonah Jameson wasn't at the Bugle. He'd been the one journalist willing to call Spider-Man out. So if it hadn't been about dealing a blow to Spider-Man's reputation, then what had been the point? Whatever this was, a trial run, an equipment test, it couldn't be an endgame. And that meant the real plot was yet to come. Without Fisk's knowledge, she goes to Michael's apartment. They fight for a bit and then they start to talk. 
talk. Maya was trying to get information on the man, and I'll put the conversation up on screen for you all to see how he acts and what was said. She walked out of his apartment more confused than ever. What was Mr. Fisk thinking? Putting his trust into someone so unpredictable? What could be so important? Fisk was a man who never took chances, who mapped out every move like a chess master. Why on earth would Fisk introduce such irrationality into his oh-so-rational world? Yet experience told her not to doubt Fisk. There had been times in the past where she'd been unable to see his, her mentor's grand strategy, though she was ashamed to admit it. There had even been a time when she doubted his innocence, yet he'd always proved himself persistent and precise, and just. Here again she might doubt, but eventually she'd see the wisdom of his actions. She knew it to be true, but she also knew that she could not let it go. After this we get to MJ and Peter having dinner. MJ tells Peter about, about getting her job at the Bugle, but Peter has to leave mid-dinner to go talk to Yuri about Fisk. Yuri tells him if he keeps doing small strikes on Fisk, they can build a case in around 18 months, which is way longer than Peter expected. Yuri tells Peter, Fisk might have the people in the police department, but I have people in Fisk's operation as well. It's no one high up, a mail clerk here, a marketing flunky there, people who can give me snippets of information for me to piece together. I've got a line on something now. It won't look like much. It's a payroll file, but I think it'll fit with some of the other data that I've collected. After the conversation with Yuri, Peter breaks into Fisk Tower and takes a picture of the file that Yuri wanted. While in the tower, he overhears Maya and Fisk talking about about power and striking at the right moment. Peter didn't know exactly what they were talking about, but he told Yuri about it after he left and met back up with her. Peter then goes to Feast to meet May, and this is also the first time that he ever me meets Martin Lee. Martin and Peter get acquainted with one another, but then Martin has to leave. Maya found the webbing Peter used while breaking into Fisk's tower, and she alerted Fisk of it. They continue to argue about going after Spider-Man now, but Fisk continued to press the fact that they will attack Spider-Man when the time is right. As Maya leaves Fisk's office, she sees MJ about to have an appointment with Fisk. Maya told MJ that Fisk will be with her shortly, not wanting MJ to walk in on Fisk at this current moment. Others may have been trying to ride his coattails, but they offer fewer units of less quality, trying to benefit from the good press without making a real contribution to the city. The work of the Fisk Foundation is changing the city for the better. I hope you include that in your story, Maya says to MJ. If it turns out to be true, I certainly will, MJ replies. Maya turned to leave, then stopped and turned back to face the reporter. In the past, reporters have come in here claiming to be working on one kind of story, but they were working on something else. Something designed to twist Mr. Fisk's work so it appeared to be something dark and illegal. You wouldn't be doing that, would you, Miss Watson? I just started at the Bugle, she said. As a features writer, it wouldn't be wise to do anything other than what I'm told. No, it wouldn't, Maya agreed. Reporters who do that sort of thing find their careers taking unfortunate turns. Then she smiled brightly. Good luck, Miss Watson. Maya then left the office, a frown coming to her face. For some reason, this reporter hadn't seen seemed troubled by the implied threat. Perhaps she wasn't smart enough to understand it, or she was more dangerous than she appeared. And that gave Maya thought. Maya then goes to meet with J. Jonah Jameson. Maya wanted to make Spider-Man's life miserable. If she couldn't do it physically, then she would do it psychologically. She would tear him down so that when it came to direct confrontation, and she had no doubt that it would, Spider-Man would be much weaker. Maya begins talking to Jameson. Mr. Jameson, we believe the city is poorer since your voice has been silenced, and we are prepared to give you an even bigger megaphone than the one you had at the Bugle. A radio broadcast of the sort we envisioned would put you everywhere in the city. In homes, in stores, in tapsy cabs. Tapsy cabs. <laughs> Would you refuse such an offer because you don't like the idea of anonymous backers? Maybe, Jameson told her. Understand up front that no one tells me what to say or what to do. You get me? You get pure Jameson. Straight, no water, no ice. If anyone starts whispering in my ear that I need to say this or that, I walk away. If that's not in the contract, then the contract doesn't get signed. I'll pass that along to the lawyers and get you the contracts by morning. Jameson reached out to shake Maya's hand. Then it looks like you've got yourself a deal. When can I start making Spider-Man's life miserable? As soon as possible. Start to organize a staff and plan out your schedule. With that, she stood and walked away. So something you kind of need to know about this part is the fact that Fisk, or no, Maya goes behind Fisk's back to get Jameson this podcast show. So it is essentially Maya's fault and Fisk's unknowing fault <laughs> that the J. Jonah Jameson real facts or whatever the fuck the show is called. Th that show exists because of this story. And that, I just find that hilarious. But next we move on. MJ tells Peter about interviewing Wilson Fisk. And as you can imagine, if you've played the game, Peter was trying to push back on this very very heavily and for good reason. But MJ interviews Wilson Fisk anyway, and things actually go well for her. And again, the whole conversation should be on the screen right now. MJ and Peter meet up to talk about things. But while they were both in line at a restaurant waiting for food, police in front of them 
ran out because something big was going down. Peter, of course, has to leave and go check it out, and when he arrives on the scene, Peter asks a cop about what's going on, and that cop just so happened to be Jefferson Davis. There was a hostage situation at an auction house. Peter got in and realized there was nothing going on in there. Maybe a false alarm or a decoy? He realized it was one of those two things after he called Yuri, but Shocker showed up at the same restaurant that MJ and Peter had just been at, but MJ was still there, and Shocker was trying to rob the place and keep hostages. He had been working with Michael Bingham to set up Spider-Man as a bad person, again. They rigged this restaurant to explode, while the real Spider-Man was distracted by what he thought could be a possible decoy that he was just that he just went after and he was still distracted by. MJ called Peter to tell him she was fine, but Peter had no clue what was happening, as he was still combing through the auction house for clues. Everything happened before he even had the chance to search the decoy place even 25%. When Peter arrived at the restaurant, there was rubble everywhere and people were dead. Cops tried to arrest him, and people in the area were furious at him, believing that the fake Spider-Man was actually him. Then after, we see a conversation conversation between Fisk and Michael regarding what Michael had done. Then this would transition into a bit of Michael's backstory. Now, I'm not going to read out the whole thing to you, but I would recommend what re reading what I put on the screen right now, as his backstory is extremely interesting and very well written. We then get a look into Peter's psyche after the explosion, feeling like the data that he's been gathering for Yuri is amounting to nothing, and feeling like the world hates him for something that he hasn't done, when in reality Michael Bingham had just set him up to make him look like a bad person. Spider-Man then goes into the bar with no name, and you'll probably remember remember that if you've played the DLC for Spider-Man PS4. There is a rule in this bar of no fighting, and funny enough, Scorpion was actually there and offers to help Spider-Man, because he senses something is going on that's weird in the city, and he doesn't like the fake Spider-Man. Peter initially went there, however, to go meet Shocker, and when he finds Shocker, he resists the urge to grab him and drag him out of the bar. Peter finds out that Shocker actually had his suit stolen a month prior, as well as his website from the same person who stole his suit, and Peter leaves to his apartment. At his apartment, Peter tracks the IP domain address, of the person currently running the website. He finds the person who stole Herman's suit, and it turns out that this person didn't actually steal Herman's suit, but he was actually an actor hired to play Shocker, and as you can imagine, he, we all know who hired him to play Shocker. If, of course, you've been reading what's <laughs> being put on the screen. <laughs> but Peter then gets the information he needed as the cops arrive to arrest both of them, but Peter gets away. MJ later has another interview with Fisk because he wanted to talk about the story that MJ had published about him. During the conversation, MJ had started to realize the sort of danger that Peter was talking about. Fisk did nothing to her, as she managed to talk her way through the conversation in a way that would help her or help her stay away from the possibility of her being killed. She was proud of herself and how she handled the situation once again. Fisk, however, did tell her to go meet with her accountants to get a better context of future stories she may write about him. She calls Peter to tell her about the incident and what she tried to get out of the accountants, but she couldn't get anything out of them. But she did find out that apparently they keep a schedule. They may be getting their marching orders from Fisk on a regular basis. She told Peter everything she'd learned from the security guards. There was no way to know how it would fit into the picture, if it did at all, but it was something. And something was exactly what Spider-Man needed at this moment. Peter began to follow an SUV security team as they went through their route, unaware that Maya Lopez had spotted him as he was following the SUVs. And as he was following, Maya tried to sneak up on him and attack him from behind. He dodged to his left, but it turned out the jab was a feint, and he only just twisted out of the way to avoid getting impaled by Maya's spear. He dodged and rolled, but she dodged and she rolled as well. He left at an angle, she left at an angle, mirroring him exactly. It seemed as if she could emulate his every move. The battle continued with Peter trying not to fight because he thought he could get information out of the girl, but due to her training speed and obvious extensive knowledge of Peter's fighting style, the fight went nowhere. Peter got pinned down, but he was able to hit her with something that she wasn't expecting. But after that, Maya was gone, and Peter was confused and lost as to where she could have gone. But even with her disguise, in a city this big, he would never be able to know where she just went. Peter then has a conversation with MJ. He shows her the picture that he took of Maya in her Echo outfit, and MJ soon realized that she looked familiar, even from her body build, as she had seen Maya already with her previous encounters with Fisk, and she told Peter who Maya was. Peter and MJ then continued arguing about their conflicting career paths. And if you know how their relationship goes in the game, this book pretty much shows why they broke up in the first place. They don't specifically break up at this point in the book, but if you read what's on the screen and you've played the game, you'll understand what I mean. A week later, Peter and MJ have their final dinner with Harry before he leaves for Europe. But if you've played the game, you know what actually happens to Harry. He doesn't go to Europe. While that was happening, Fisk and Norman Osborn had a conversation actually a few blocks down from them. Osborn goes to Fisk because Fisk offered a proposal that could be mutually beneficial for both of them. Them. And Fisk also has blackmail on Norman Osborn. Again, you can pause to read this whole conversation for more context, but this seems to be related to what is mentioned in the game that MJ tells Peter about. Have you learned anything from that Devil's Breath file? Yes, get this. A few years 
ago, Osborne came to Fisk and asked him to build a lab, but to keep it hidden from regulators. Secret lab? For Devil's Breath? If it's as dangerous as we think it is, I can see why. Where's the lab? It's not in the file. Osborne made Fisk destroy all records of it. All I have are invoices from Osborne's personal account to Fisk Construction. Knowing Fisk, he kept the invoices around for blackmail material on the mayor. I don't think this is the exact same thing, but it's like, it's sort of related in the same realm of like where Fisk and Osborne's relationship lies. But while Osborne and Fisk talk, Blood Spider watched. And sorry for not mentioning this earlier, but Michael Bingham is actually someone from the comics called Blood Spider. Anyways, we get a look into his psyche as he watches the two talk. And again, I'll put it up on the screen as it's really damn interesting. This guy is really a fucking nut job, and he has a very tragic backstory too, so I would recommend, again, reading what I put on the screen. As the story continues, however, Peter goes to the Bugle to talk with MJ about Fisk. It's then that he figures out what happened to Maya Lopez's father, and after reviewing the file, him and MJ realize that Fisk definitely had him killed, and that Maya probably didn't even know that Fisk had her father killed, because Maya believed that Spider-Man had killed her father, and Peter figured this out by realizing the way that she was fighting him. She was a woman fighting with pure rage. The fight felt personal, as he didn't even know the girl yet. But Peter then went to an assistant district attorney's house to get any information he might have on Fisk. Because before Peter was attacked by Echo earlier, he saw Fisk's men giving some woman drugs. And this woman was the assistant DA's sister. This was most likely a way to blackmail the assistant DA. And again, I'll put their conversation up on the screen. But Spider-Man then got a tip from Yuri about Andy from the beginning of the story's brother, and then Peter went to go talk to him. After talking with Andy's brother, Yuri informed Peter that the assistant DA had been killed by Blood Spider. After this, Peter meets Yuri on a rooftop to discuss the matter and figure out Fisk further. But from afar, Echo was watching them, and she read their lips through her binoculars to see what they were talking about, and she saw that they were talking about Fisk. So she sent a text to Jameson reading, Spider-Man is a connection inside the police department. They're protecting him from prosecution, and of course, you can all imagine what Jameson did with that information. <laughs> but later while at work, talking to one of his supervisors, Peter figures out what Fisk is really up to. Fisk wants to become commissioner of finance in New York so that he can have so much power that the city can't afford to bring him down, as that would cause the city's economy to be destroyed if he was to be brought down. Peter put these pieces together and figured this was Fisk's end goal. A few weeks later, Peter got a major alert from Yuri saying that the gathering that Fisk was attending, which MJ was also attending, because she was shadowing Wilson Fisk was going to be attacked. Peter arrived there and waited for a long time. He was missing work just because he had to be there as Spider-Man. Yuri's source said that there was going to be a small army coming to attack Fisk, but there was no signs of anyone, except for three men who had just arrived in trench coats with guns. Three men could theoretically take down Fisk, and they might actually do it with a lot less collateral damage. While the pistols weren't exactly sniper-grade weaponry, the chances of a bystander getting hurt were highly unacceptable. Peter was going to have to intervene. I'd better get a thank you from you Fisk, or at least a fruit basket. He called Yuri to update the situation, and Yuri said maybe you should hang back unless they make a move, but that wasn't an option for Peter because MJ was down there. Making a move isn't going to take them long, he said, and it's going to involve pieces of lead moving at high velocity. Okay, I'm calling it in, Yuri said. Hold off for as long as you can without risking anyone getting hurt. Backup will be there soon, and if you can get out without being seen, it'll make everyone's life easier. As soon as he ended the call, he saw that the three men were moving out of the shadows and approaching the crowd. No one had noticed them yet. He shouted a web so that he could swing down, but as soon as he leapt off his perch, he saw three more men in trench coats emerging from the other side of the room. That meant he couldn't take all of the invaders at once. Worse yet, the commotion started. People would panic. In the confusion, the gunmen would have a harder time finding their target, but the risk to innocence would be much greater. He turned back to the original trio and realized that he made a huge mistake. In the instant that he'd been distracted, the attackers had removed their coats, which were lying behind them and on the ground. Underneath the coats, the gunmen were dressed as police officers. Officers under attack, one of them shouted, and he began firing his gun. Spider-Man flipped in the air, convulting into a twist away from bullets. He could feel them zipping past him, missing him by inches. The other three men lost their coats as well, and raced in, their own weapons at the ready. Worse, there were real cops in the room, and they thought their fellow officers were in danger. That would make them far more likely to shoot first and take stock later. Everything unfolded as if it were being choreographed. People shouted and ran. As the real policemen rushed forward, the imposters melted back into the crowd. They grabbed their coats, which they would use to get away. The real police officers in the meantime drew their guns aiming at Spider-Man, who was, as far as they could tell, assaulting the gathering. Someone was going to get hurt, most likely him. He launched himself into the 
shadows to get out the way he'd come in. Someone discharged their gun and plaster shattered into dust. His spider sense exploded and he webbed across the room, hardly aware he was changing direction. Another blast of gunfire and he changed direction again. As soon as one of the cops started firing, the rest followed suit and he was vaguely aware of the discordant popping as he dodged back and forth. He saw his chance to make it into the skylight and shot out a web hurling himself forward. Risking a quick glance over his shoulder, he saw MJ looking up at him as though he had failed her utterly. After the mess was over, Peter was on the roof and he got a call from his job. Your mind is not second rate, but I'm afraid I've concluded that we would be better off with someone a little bit less intelligent and a little more reliable. I'm saying you're fired, Peter. Peter felt his mouth hanging open. He worked at the lab since college. He loved working there. He couldn't be fired. And just so you all don't think this contradicts the game or anything, <laughs> later in the story, Otto finds out that the person who fired Peter wasn't actually, they didn't actually have the power to fire him. So instead, Peter was rehired and the person that hired, or the person that fired Peter was was fired. <laughs> but Peter's life was falling apart. Yuri had to pause working with him due to risking hit or their their relationship being discovered. Fisk had set the whole attack up and he had someone give the department a false lead knowing that Spider-Man was working with the police. After this, Peter goes to MJ's house. They argue about what just happened, and I'll put the whole conversation up on screen for you to read if you want, but damn, man. Peter's life just went from like a like a 6 out of 10 to like a negative 100 out of 10 in one day. Then we move back to Blood Spider, and we continue to explore his backstory as well as his history with Spider-Man. Again, I should have this up on the screen if you want to read it, and again, I recommend you do read this. A few weeks later, Peter was depressed. He was sitting in his apartment waiting for pizza when MJ knocked on the door to check on him. She knew Peter was depressed. They talked for a bit and she asks him about Fisk. She didn't want Peter to keep throwing himself a pity party and just give up on the matter. She later leaves and Peter sits with his thoughts and knows that MJ was right. The next day, he walks into the Daily Bugle. He goes to MJ and tells her, Maya Lopez. She hates me. She loves Fisk, but he has to be lying to her. She thinks that I killed her father. If I can convince her that she's wrong, maybe I can get her to help me. MJ helps Peter get Maya's address and Peter breaks into Maya's apartment. While she was in the shower, and no, this isn't going where you think it's going. <laughs> Peter left the note on the wall so that she would see it as soon as she got out of the shower. The note read, we have unfinished business. Meet me on the roof, bring an open mind, but you can leave the spirit home please. Maya cautiously went to Spider-Man expecting an attack. Peter did nothing, but Maya was still being cautious and angry. Spider-Man and Maya fought for a while due to the rage that she had against Spider-Man, but Peter did nothing but dodge trying to get her to see that he was there in sincerity, and Maya begins to realize that. As the fight comes to an end, Peter makes a joke about Fisk, a joke that actually made Maya laugh. She was confused why she just laughed, as it even caught her off guard, but it was then that she started to realize that Spider-Man was telling the truth and that he was sincere about their meeting. She questions him one last time on how she can know if the file that Peter has given her about her father was even real, but Peter tells her to go to the cops for herself, if of course she doesn't believe him. She was the daughter of the victim and they would provide her with a copy if she so chooses. It was then that they make peace and start to team up to take Fisk down. After they were done strategizing a plan to get Fisk, they break into his office to steal thumb drives that had blackmail on Norman Osborne. They found that the drives weren't there, but just after figuring that out, Fisk barged into his office with Blood Spider, as Fisk found out that Maya had betrayed him. They all get into a a fight, but Spider-Man manages to get him and Maya out of there, as this would gain them nothing. It's then revealed that Blood Spider was the one who took the drives that were in the safe. He was working for Norman Osborn. Norman was the one who gave Blood Spider his powers, but Blood Spider wasn't interested in working for anyone. Fisk and him fought, but Blood Spider got the upper hand. Fisk had to agree to work for Blood Spider. It was either that or death for the fat man. <laughs> Peter and Maya prepared their next move to try and get the drive. They knew Blood Spider had it, and they thought the only way to stop Fisk from becoming commissioner of finance was to play to Blood Spider's unstable nature, and relying on a chance that he'd be there, as this was one of their only options they had left, if not the only option. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention for a moment? The room went silent as all conversations came to a halt, and Peter winced at the sound of MJ doing a facepalm. She had to think this was the most idiotic stunt of his career, and he wasn't entirely sure that MJ was wrong. Definitely top 10. I just want to offer a few words about my friend Wilson Fisk, Spider-Man said loudly, standing with his feet on the ceiling. Businessman, philanthropist, kingpin, super gigantic dude. You all know him, you all hate him, but you have to pretend like you like him because you don't want to wake up with a horse's head between your sheets. The cops looked unsure, confused. 
Yuri was talking to some of them, trying to keep them from drawing their guns. She had no idea what was going on and must have thought he'd lost his mind. He would have given Yuri a heads up, but she tried to have talked him out of this, and she might even have taken steps to prevent him from going ahead. I understand the mayor. Hey, there's Norman. I understand the mayor is thinking about naming Fisk the commissioner of finance. That may not be the smartest idea. Peter scanned the room for Blood Spider, but still didn't see him. That's really all I wanted to say, so I'll stop disturbing your evening. Except to ask that anyone here who might be the Spider-Man impar impersonator, please step forward. If you're the one going around trying to smear my name by hunting people, committing murder, and generally being a jerk, come on, show yourself. Don't be shy. Standing next to Fisk, Norman Osborne permitted himself a smile. On second thought, Wilson, I don't think I'll be offering you that position. It was you all along, wasn't it? Fisk sought to control his expression. You sent him to me as a spy. I just put him in your way, and you snapped him up. But I knew what you would be dealing with. I knew he was unstable. It was a calculated move. Either he'd do what I told him, or not. He would destroy you from the inside. I don't know how this will end with him, but your hold over me is done. He still has a copy of the files, Fisk told Norman. You'd better pray I don't regain control of it. I don't pray, Osborne said. Praying is for people who like to leave things to chance. But Spider-Man and Echo's plan worked. Blood Spider leaped to Spider-Man and the fight began. Peter learned a lot from fighting Echo. He'd learn about his own style, how he relied on his moves and patterns, patterns he hadn't even known that were in his lexicon. Then he'd learn how to force himself to think differently, not like himself. It was shadow boxing, so he'd had to find a way to trick his shadow. Blood Spider wasn't Echo, though. He could do what Spider-Man did, but he'd never studied his moves. He wanted to be Spider-Man, but it hadn't taken the time how to learn to be Spider-Man. It was time for a lesson. This fight was a long battle of both spiders getting the upper hand on one another, Peter not allowing rage to continue to cloud his thinking while Blood Spider was filled with rage only and trying to antagonize Spider-Man's emotions the whole fight. In the midst of their fight, Fisk and Echo went at it, where Echo would wind up destroying the drives that held all the blackmail on North. Norman. Peter soon after eventually finally gets the upper hand on Blood Spider, and Michael Bingham had finally been arrested. Still in his Spider-Man suit, he used his phone to check the video footage of the police leading Wilson Fisk out of the ballroom. Nothing was going to stick, of course, but everyone had seen him punch Maya. There would be questions. The media was sure to find out that Maya was his foster child. Still, she was dressed in a costume, and it would be easy for Fisk to argue that he hadn't recognized her, that he'd felt threatened by someone who could have been as dangerous as the one Spider-Man or any other powerful criminal. It was a safe bet that Fisk lawyers would have him out on the street in the hour. Whatever the Kingpin had on Norman Osborn was lost forever. Spider-Man wasn't sure how he felt about that. No one should be able to blackmail the mayor of New York. On the other hand, it would be better if the mayor wasn't doing things that left him susceptible to blackmail. The world, however, was a complicated place, and he'd have to hope that Norman Osborn would seek power through being an effective leader rather than abusing his authority. Wilson Fisk was never going to be commissioner of finance, and that was a huge win. It wasn't a win like seeing Fisk tried for murder, but it gave Spider-Man time to dig in further. It gave him room to breathe, and Michael Bingham, the false Spider-Man, was in custody. All on the news they said he was being sent for psychiatric evaluation, it was likely he'd end up in Ravencroft rather than a rather than a prison like the Raft. That was fine as far as Peter was concerned though. Clearly the guy was nuts. Peter and Echo have one last conversation. Peter tells Maya that killing Fisk isn't the right way to do things, and maybe she even agreed with him to some extent, but she wanted to give it some more thought. Maya told Peter that she would go out to Montana to visit some family, and also learn more about her father. And as a going away gift, Maya gave Peter a bunch of files related to dirt on Fisk. Yuri then comes up to the roof where Peter was. They talk for a bit, and then Peter gives Yuri the files that Maya had just given to him. She tells him, I'll need to digest this, but it looks huge. There are lots of avenues to pursue. It could take months to run it all down, but if even some of what's in here checks out, it could make the difference. Then, a few months later into this same story, we all get transitioned into the next story, and that next story was this masterpiece right here. I honestly thought this book was great. I would have loved to see this story adapted to like a movie or even a TV show. I really enjoyed what we got here, even if I am five years late to reading this book. We got a lot of stuff expanding the universe and a lot more background and depth to Fisk, Peter, MJ, and Yuri. I do want to say, I kind of, there is some, some real like context in this book that like I didn't really go over. So I do think it's still better that you all read this on your own if you really care that much. I will leave the link in the description to the book if you all want to buy it but with all that being said i want to give a shout out to all my patreons if you would like to support me on patreon it's only two dollars a month and i would appreciate it a lot i thank you all so much for watching spider-man 2 is coming out in the next couple days i will be streaming the whole game so again if you made it to the end i appreciate you a lot and uh yeah